Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about computing spherical aberration in continuation of the previous video on building a YNU spreadsheet. If you haven't seen that one yet, you can go back and watch it and then come back and watch this video on using the spreadsheet to compute spherical aberration. Spherical aberration is the first of the five Seidel aberrations. Spherical aberration is a result of incoming rays not focusing to the same point on the optic axis. The higher the ray is above the optic axis, the farther from the paraxial focal point it will be. Look at a paraxial ray coming in parallel to the optic axis and near to it. It strikes the first surface of the lens at a certain angle and then it refracts and strikes the second surface at another incident angle, refracts again, and finally hits the optic axis at the paraxial focus. A ray that comes in lower will do the same thing. It will refract at each surface and ultimately strike the optic axis at the same point as the other ray. At which point then you can say these incoming rays are focused. They're paraxial rays. They're close enough to the optic axis that they both meet at the paraxial focus as opposed to a ray that comes in farther up. For example, the marginal ray, which is way at the outer edge. It will arrive at the optic axis at a different point, either before the paraxial focus or farther from the paraxial focus. The distance between the focal point for marginal rays and the paraxial rays is the longitudinal spherical aberration. And it could be in front of the paraxial focus or behind the paraxial focus. If it's behind the paraxial focus, you refer to it as negative spherical aberration. And that's typically the case for a diverging lens. A converging lens will usually have positive spherical aberration. Let's follow all of the rays coming in to this plano convex lens. First, the marginal rays, and where they meet is the marginal focus, and they continue on from there. The paraxial rays come in and meet at a different place as the paraxial focus, and all rays that are close to the optic axis will meet at the paraxial focus. The separation is the longitudinal aberration. So rays that are maybe between the paraxial bunch of rays and the marginal ray will have a meeting point that is somewhere between the marginal focus and the paraxial focus. If you put a dot every place where a ray meets its neighbor, you can trace out something called the caustic. So putting a dot wherever a ray crosses a neighboring ray will trace out that caustic, including the point of paraxial focus where two nearest paraxial rays are meeting in this illustration. Connecting the dots gives you a curve that you call the caustic. If you bring in these parallel rays that may be from a point source far out, like a star, they converge on the optic axis, but not at a point. So you get a blurred point instead of the nice sharp crisp point that you would expect. But there is a place you would imagine along the optic axis where you get the best image. If I put my screen at the paraxial focus, I really won't have a very good image because the marginal rays are converging somewhere else. If I put my screen at the point of marginal focus, I might have a better image, possibly, but I still won't have the best image. To find the best image, you need to find the circle of least confusion, otherwise called the point of minimum blur. The way you find it is look at the marginal ray from one side of the lens and look at where it crosses the caustic. And that point will be the point where the focus is best, yeah, the minimum blur or the circle of least confusion. And that's a good place to put the screen to look at the image. Any place else, you'll actually have a blurrier image. If you're imaging a star, you would expect to see a point on the screen of light. Instead, you'll get this blurred out image with a circular pattern that is uh, independent of this azimuthal angle. It's the same as you go all the way around the circle. That is a fingerprint of spherical aberration. There's no angle dependence on the screen. If you go somewhere between the minimum blur and the praxial focus, you'll get this nice blurry image. If you go to the marginal focus, you'll have a crisper pattern, but it will still be less well focused than if you are at the point of minimum blur. In a pencil and paper analysis, you look at two groups of rays, tangential rays and sagittal rays. The tangential rays are a set of parallel rays that impinge upon the first surface of the optical system. They might come in parallel to the optic axis, or they might not. You might have this angle phi that measures their angle relative to the optic axis. And those tangential rays might hit a lens and then 
focus, and then you have a surface where an image forms. Now, if light fills, say, the entrance pupil of an optical system, then that same light will fill an image on the image surface. And we have two important coordinates to talk about. Rho is the normalized coordinate on the pupil, and H is the normalized coordinate on the image surface. By normalized, that means when you get out to the edge of the pupil or out to the edge of the image, that coordinate equals 1, and it's less than 1 inside. Rho and H are not guaranteed to be in the same direction. What that means is that a point of light at the tip of Rho ends up on the image surface at the tip of H, and it might be rotated in angle theta relative to where it was originally in the pupil. That defines the angle theta, which is a consequence of a dot product between rho and h, and we have our rho and h vectors. Sagittal rays fall along a line that is perpendicular to the line that the tangential rays fall along. If the tangential rays enter the optical system at a skewed angle phi, the field angle, then so do the sagittal rays. You optimize an optical system within a range of acceptable field angles. For example, I want this to work with a field angle plus 10 to minus 10 degrees, for example. So again, the tangential rays and the sagittal rays, there they are together. And the number that is first computed is the wavefront aberration, which is the deviation between the incident wavefront, which is already aberrated by other elements, perhaps, and whatever surface is meeting, which may actually be perfectly spherical, and so we'll call that the reference sphere. Y is the height where the wave is incident upon the glass, and the wavefront aberration W then is the difference in optical path length that the wave will experience, so the distance from point P to L minus the distance from point P to L prime is the wavefront aberration. Right in terms of those line segments, so V is the location of the vertex, V L prime then is this distance from V to L prime, minus the distance from P to L prime inside the glass, minus V to L, minus the distance from P to L, times the index refraction outside, so you get the difference between what you have with the glass versus what you would have without the glass, and that's the wavefront aberration. Getting from this point to working equations is a lot of algebra. And it goes through this polynomial expansion, the Seidel polynomial. W is the wavefront aberration. H and rho are the field coordinate and pupil coordinates, respectively. The wavefront aberration it goes as various terms that include H and rho and cosine of the angle between them. They all have this expansion coefficients, W, which is the, going to be the business of what we're doing today. W sub 400 is the piston, W sub 040 is the spherical aberration, W sub 220 is the field curvature, 222 is the astigmatism, 131 is coma, 311 is distortion. We're focused on spherical aberration today. So our goal is to compute W sub 040, and that is how spherical aberration is quantified. This expansion is more compactly expressed as a summation. I would point out that k is 0 for spherical aberration, as is i. So spherical aberration really just depends on the pupil coordinate to the fourth power. Always to fourth power, you'll notice the first two digits in all of these subscripts add up to four. That's a fourth order wave aberration, often referred to as a third order ray aberration because ray aberrations are the derivative of wave aberrations. In the case of spherical aberration, k is zero, which is important because that means that the ray will not be rotated. If k is not zero, then when a ray hits the pupil, it arrives then later at the image rotated from the original location. Spherical aberration doesn't do that. And so spherical aberration makes those circular patterns that we saw previously. It's these coefficients, w, that we're going to be working on calculating. They're related to the Seidel coefficients. That's the work of a mathematician. The Seidel coefficients go by the names S sub 1, S sub 2, 3, 4, and 5. S sub 1 for spherical aberration, S sub 2 for coma, S sub 3 for stigmatism, S sub 4 for field curvature, S sub 5 for distortion. S sub 1 for spherical aberration is written as a sum over all the surfaces. First talk about what's inside the summation. You have the marginal rate invariant, which is the index of refraction times the incident angle, squared times the height of the ray above the optic axis, 
times the difference of the ratio of angle with the normal divided by index of refraction on either side of the surface. Let's expand out that delta. U is the angle that the ray makes with the normal, and prime means after the surface. It's the marginal ray, because there's no bar above the U, divided by the index of refraction, and this is after the surface minus what it was before the surface. Let's illustrate that with a picture. Imagine a point source on the optic axis that emits a ray which hits the surface, reflects off per the law of reflection, and refracts through per Snell's law. And that's what we're going to be concerned about here. We'll call your angle I, the incident angle. That's the angle that you use in Snell's law. Y is the height above the optic axis. So this angle made by the radius of curvature and the optic axis is the arctangent of y divided by the radius of curvature. And in the praxial limit, that's just y divided by the radius of curvature, or yc. u is the angle relative to the horizontal of the incoming ray, and u prime will be the angle of the transmitted ray relative to the horizontal. This is the same angle that we showed in the triangle down here, that's yc. So the incident angle is u plus yc. That's the reason for this belabored drawing here, because sometimes it's difficult to figure out what is the incident angle. Always go back to u plus yc for the incident angle. So let's use the working equation in the YNU spreadsheet. And I have an example in here of a simple biconvex lens, not equiconvex, so different radii of curvature, but they're both convex. So the first surface has a positive radius of curvature, the second one is negative. The distance between the two vertices is 10 millimeters. Take an entrance pupil diameter of 10 millimeters, and since this is just a lens, the diameter of the lens is the entrance pupil diameter. So the marginal ray will be 5 millimeters above the optic axis. The material has an index of refraction of 1.5168 EK7, and we'll assume infinite conjugates. That is, when we talk about the marginal ray, we'll talk about a horizontal ray parallel to the optic axis. And we want the design to work for a maximum field angle of plus 10 degrees. The first surface has a radius of curvature that's given. The distance to the second surface is 10 millimeters. The power is calculated. The marginal ray height when the ray strikes that surface is 5 millimeters, unrefracted. And the angle after passing through the surface is minus 0.01366 radians. That's calculated from praxis ray tracing equation number 1. As the ray arrives at the surface, its incident angle is 0 0.04009 radians. You can calculate that with the expression I equals U plus YC that we just worked out. The chief ray should arrive at the center of the lens at zero. Angle is minus 0.174 radians. After refraction, it will have this angle of 0.115 radians. And then the ray transfers to surface 2. So this is all the stuff that we talked about in the last video, so you can go and look at that. What I want to talk about now is calculating the spherical aberration with the Seidel aberration coefficient that I had up previously. Applying the Seidel aberration expression to surface 1, we have n times i quantity squared, that's the marginal ray invariant squared, times the height above the optic axis, times the difference in u over n at surface 1, just using the numbers in the column above. At surface 2, using the numbers of the column above, you get these numbers. And then this is the neat thing about Seidel coefficients across multiple surfaces. They add. So you calculate the Seidel coefficient at the first surface, calculate the Seidel coefficient at the second surface, calculate it at the third surface. Every time there's a surface in your optical system, you calculate the Seidel coefficient. And then when you get all done, you add them all up. And you have the total Seidel coefficients, the sum of, of all the others. And so the spherical aberration is 0 0.0023398, the units are millimeters. The coefficient W sub 040 is the Seidel coefficient divided by 8, and you get 0.0029248, millimeters. It's often reported in waves instead of in terms of millimeters, and that means you take the W sub 040 and you divide out the wavelength. This is what you call monochromatic aberration. We're not considering chromatic aberration here. And so usually you use the D line, which is 587 nanometers, or 587 times 10 by 6 millimeters. 
and you get 0.4983, usually written as 0.4983 times lambda or 0.4983 waves. You can go to Zmax and calculate it there. There's the same lens in Zmax and I have the Rayfan plots as well. So you can definitely see there is spherical aberration here. Zmax computes 0.4983 waves for the spherical aberration coefficient, W sub 040. In future videos, we'll take a look at the rest of these, coma and astigmatism and distortion and field curvature. For now, it's just spherical aberration. You can go ahead and write your own YNU spreadsheet and add in spherical aberration. And you'll get something that optical design software calculates if you use this expression for the Seidel coefficient. You can use this spreadsheet now to teach yourself things about optical design. Let's try some other lenses. So the lens that we already did had this configuration. We had a 124 millimeter radius of curvature on the front and a shorter 85 millimeter radius of curvature on the back. It was otherwise double convex. Now let's try some other approaches. I want to know this. Suppose I have a plano convex lens. So the first surface has an infinite radius of curvature. Then there's this length, which is, oh, five millimeters. And then we have a radius of curvature. We'll keep our 85. We'll replace the 124 with infinity, which is just a very large number. And we'll replace the 10 with the five. And the Seidel coefficient on the very first surface is essentially zero, and therefore the total Seidel aberration, which is the sum of the two, is just 0. 0.00117. Let's flip this lens around and see what difference it makes. So the first surface is 85.848 millimeters, and the second surface is a very big number. It doesn't matter if you make it positive or negative. Well, now look at the spherical aberration on the flat surface. It's no longer 10 to the minus 19, it's only 10 to the minus 5. But look at the spherical aberration on the first surface. It's considerably smaller. So now we have a Seidel coefficient S1 of 0.0002219 millimeters. So you get less spherical aberration with the plano convex lens if you put the convex side first. Can you think about why that would be? With the planar surface first, a ray that's parallel to the optic axis comes along and hits the surface perpendicular. Nothing happens to it. And it gets to the back surface, where there will be a certain angle resulting in refraction coming out. That same ray hitting the convex surface first hits the first surface and does refract, and it hits the second surface, where it will refract some more. But you'll see that the outcoming ray has less refraction. Compare that to what a paraxial ray in the system will do versus this case, a paraxial ray will have all this refraction at the second surface. You'll find that, that the distance from the back of the lens to where those rays converge is shorter in this case than it is here. If it always helps the spherical aberration to split the refraction among multiple surfaces. When you ask one surface to do all of the refraction, the spherical aberration will be larger. Now, how can we get some negative spherical aberration? We'll make the rays of curvature on the first surface. Oh, we'll let that remain 85, 0.848. Second uh, surface has a raise of curvature. It looks larger than that. It is. Sure, let's make it 100. Both positive. So this being 100. Now the Seidel coefficient for the second surface is minus 7.96 times 10 to the minus 5. And for the first surface is 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4, giving us a total spherical aberration of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4. So I'll stop it with that. Thank you for watching this demonstration of computation of spherical aberrations and how to use a YNU spreadsheet to learn something about how you can control spherical aberration in a singlet design.